Well, hello, everyone. Hi, I'm, I'm George Wimberly. I am the Director of Professional Development and the Diversity Officer at the American Educational Research Association, AERA. And I want to welcome you today to our informational webinar on the AERA Minority Dissertation Fellowship Program in Education Research. So glad that you all are able to join us today for this webinar. Uh, two things I just want to make a note as we get started here, because I keep I'm looking here in the room, and there's like there must be over there over 600 people joining, and I'm just giving them all a moment to come on. But one thing to, to make a note is that we are using American Sign Language interpreters today. So I want to thank them for providing their services. We are also providing closed captioning for today's webinar. Uh, unfortunately, Zoom has been having some off and on problems with their closed captioning today. So in addition to our, our closed captioner, we will put a link in the chat box that will show you where you can actually, you can go to a website for closed captioning in addition in case uh, it, the closed captioning stops working today but also thank our closed captioner who is, who is definitely working hard to make sure that they're able to capture today's conversation. I also want to introduce Stephanie McGee, who is from AERA. She is our, our program associate who is going to be working with us today and in today's webinar. Uh, we're going to use the question and answer box and Stephanie is going to be busily uh, responding to your, your questions in that box. Um, we will also have some question, uh, comments that will come into chat, but given that we have so many people on chat today, I, I'm going to uh, ask that you refrain from conversations in chat because there may be even a couple of times we'll want you to actually enter something. So to refrain, refrain from the, sort of the idle chit chat in chat. That's, that's how I sometimes like to put that. But Stephanie will be responding to your questions and then we will stop at a certain point in the presentation where we'll, we'll take other questions from the audience and Stephanie will deliver those questions. So thanks. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk just a little bit about our program here and about AERA. I know that, you know, I often assume that people know about us, but that's not always the case. But we are a national research society, or some would even say also with international reach, international reach, and we are concerned with improving educational processes and scientific inquiry. We're really about not only is it that we're passing on information and sharing knowledge about education and the application of educational activities, but also really promoting research and research results. We have about um, 26,000 or so members, um, but we have a reach that goes beyond our membership that probably reaches about five, five or six times that amount of people uh, who are not only faculty and, and universities and colleges across the country and around the world, but also researchers, scholars in multiple disciplines from education research, other disciplines in the, in the behavioral and social sciences, the humanities, uh, as well as people working in K-12 school districts, um, other practitioners, and state and federal government. So we, we have a broad reach. Many know us for our, our journals, our peer review journals and, and books and things that we publish, as well as a lot of our capacity building activities, not only including our dissertation and research grants, but also a lot of our professional development courses and other activities that are aimed at building the next generation of scholars. Others also know us for our, an annual meeting that we have uh, each year that brings together over 15,000 scholars across uh, of our couple thousand presentations that be these paper sessions and round tables, poster sessions, as well as numerous opportunities for networking and mentoring uh, across a generation of scholars. You can always can find more information about us on our website. I mentioned uh, our journals. We have seven peer-reviewed journals that uh, have been around there. 
that, that are listed here, just to give you an idea. Uh, these are some of the leading journals in education research. We're quite, quite proud of the, the, the research that is published and disseminated through these journals. And as I, I was also mentioning, our annual meeting, the 2021 annual meeting is next April, and this will be a virtual meeting. So much like as we are coming to you today virtually, this will be uh, a virtual meeting next spring. And so some more things will be, uh, more announcements about that meeting will be forthcoming in the months to come here. Also looking forward to 2022, where we will have our annual meeting will be in San Diego. All right. All right, so that's a little bit about me and us and AERA. Uh, so I have a question for you, I have a poll question. And I'm going to ask that we can pull up this first question. I want to get an idea of who is, who's out here with us, because I'm seeing something like there are over 800 participants on this call right now. So just to take a moment to answer this poll, where you can please, where you're indic indicating your primary role. Now, I know we often have a lot of graduate students. I'm trying to just distinguish are there those who are in a education school versus those who are not in education school. There may be people from universities specifically here and offices of sponsored programs, other faculty, researchers here. So just to get an idea who are, who are our participants today. Let's give you a moment. All right, I'm hoping everyone's had a moment to respond. Maybe we can, sort, we can see the results here from this poll. Oh, great. As I thought, there would probably be there. A lot of you are definitely graduate students here who are probably seeking this funding and all. So this is, this is great, very helpful. All right. So I'm gonna talk a little bit specifically about the AERA Minority Dissertation Fellowship Program in Education Research. Just a little bit of sort of a background is that uh, back in so 1991 or so, the AERA Council uh, developed this program and with the aim of increasing the number of people of color, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, who are in faculty positions. And one way of doing this is thinking about the pipeline uh, from graduate school into these faculty positions, not only providing funding uh, for outstanding graduate students in education research, but also some mentoring and networking opportunities through AERA. Um, the earlier iterations of this, this program, that at one point there may, we, we would have maybe one or two fellows that would be around, that would have this fellowship for a year, and there would, there would be funding and some other professional development act, activities. Um, into the early 2000s, when I, when I came on to AERA, we, we revamped the program somewhat, made some tweaks, and we've been able to fund uh, about five or six scholars each year. And we've been able to have, have those scholars not only uh, providing funding, but also participate in the AERA annual meeting, as well as some other mentoring activities. I'm, we're all very proud to say that the scholars from this program have gone on to publish their research in major peer-reviewed journals, including some of the AERA journals, but and also though have been, in, are now in faculty positions, uh, working in not only at universities, but also scholars who at research organizations, uh, in federal government, state governments as well. So the contribution from this program has been, has been quite wide and we're quite, quite proud of that, that this program is, has been a success and the commitment to this program uh, continues maybe in that sense. We recently have renewed our interest in this and the and ERA has made this recommitment that definitely we are, we are focusing on 
this specific fellowship program. To give you an idea to some of our scholars who we have recently funded this last year, these are our current fellows, and uh, their work is, is spanning from the fields of not only within education research directly, but they're sociologists and historians uh, among our current fellows. Their research is uh, both quantitative as well as qualitative. Some are using large scale data sets, uh, some are out collecting data, doing interviews, where others are actually doing historical analysis, archival type research. So we are quite proud as well of our, our current fellows. And you can learn more about these fellows uh, as well on the, on the AERA website. So to really think about the big question is who is eligible for this fellowship? This is a question we all wait, we often get. And to really be most specific is that first, our, our members are people who are from racial and ethnic groups that are underrepresented in education research. Specifically, we, this program targets African Americans, Hispanics or Latinos, Asian Americans, American Indians or Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, or Pacific Islanders. That those are the groups who we are targeting for this specific fellowship. One other thing is that the, at what stage is a question we often get from, from our graduate students as they apply for this uh, fellowship. This is a, a one-year fellowship and we are aimed at advanced graduate students who are in that last stage of the, the dissertation. Usually it's, it's seen as that write-up year where that this is that time where they can, students can pull away from everything and sort of burn that candle by themselves for that year um, throughout that, that one, one year of fellowship. Our applicants um, must be committed to working full time um, on the dissertation and their course requirements, being a full time student, uh, however, your institution defines a full time student uh, and during, during that period. One of the things, though, you know, so at this point, the year, all fellows are at advanced candidacy. They have that year that they're writing, that these funds are available, and that they're able to, to focus on their dissertation. We, we do limit this fellowship to U.S. citizens or permanent residents, or the, uh, also who are those who are at a U.S. institution. Now, international students who are studying in the U.S., on a visa are not eligible. Those are SDI group that is ineligible for this specific fellowship. As we are part of our aim for this fellowship is that to add the diversity to faculty uh, in the US. The other main eligibility requirement is that the person's dissertation study must focus on an education research topic. Uh, that is key. So as we start talking about topics, now this can be quite broad, broadly defined as how education research is broadly defined. And I'll list some of the topics here from things around student achievement, STEM learning, uh, history of education, uh, mathematics and science education, issues around uh, parent involvement, studies that sort of are also spanning uh, the lifespan of, from say from birth to early childhood, the K-12 years, post-secondary education, and the workforce. Our, our, this research often will be based in schools or, or, or within a schooling context. Uh, we do always often find that we do have studies and encourage studies that will we'll focus on issues that are around race, gender, culture, ethnicity, things of that in nature. Also that there's a, you know, we can see even when there's a policy and a practice relevant uh, aspects of the research and you know, that's clearly defined. Not necessarily some of the things when we talk about with policies and practice, not, that's not necessarily a requirement, but we do open, we are open to those type of dissertations as well as to things around historical analysis or even or, or a theoretical piece.
So the methods used in these studies are often are quite vast to refund. Uh, a lot of uh, from anything from quantitative, qualitative work, mixed method design, um, historical analysis, action research, survey research, uh, just in some areas to name. But really, the, we are focusing on studies that are involving um, rigorous research methods that are that and will yield studies that we'll, we hope that one day will be published in, in peer-reviewed journals within the field or that are suitable for practitioner journals within the field of education and education research. So now, I know we have a lot of graduate students who are, mo are mostly on here. Um, I, I have a second poll question where I wanna get an idea of what research methods that you are using in your current research for your dissertation? So I'm going to ask the Duke. It's going to put up our second poll question. Yes, which research method are you using in your dissertation study? Just to get a nice an idea here. So take a moment. Okay, as we've had that moment, let's see what are we getting as the results. Let's see what you all are doing. What, what, which methods are you using? Ah, wow, if you see this, it's, it's a good mix, but mainly it looks like mostly qualitative research methods uh, with 48% um, of the people who are here today. But then it's, it's a bit around mixed methods as well as some quantitative methods and other. So I, and I think this is really good. I've seen these responses is that, and not only the percentages, but the number, is that this is very, uh, quite reflective on what the program has offered, what we do support. So you know, definitely um, you know, quite diverse research methods that are used which often you know, yields to just different topics that people would study within education research. Great. So let's, get, let's get back then to what actually we are able, we are funding, what, this, what the award is here for this program. So specifically, uh, people who are awarded uh, this fellowship, there's now a $25,000 stipend that is up for this, uh, the 20, 122 academic year this next this next cycle uh, we're, we're, we're pleased that AERA council was approved that we that we can now award a $25,000 stipend and this can be used for uh, you know for fees any, anything that's related to your education and research fees from tuition uh, books living expenses uh, travel equipment software computers anything along that line uh, we, we do encourage cost sharing for, you know, from universities. In some cases, universities are so proud that their, their students have this funding that they will waive tuition and any other fees so that any things that can, can really help their students to be able to take advantage of this funding to, funding to its fullest during that final year as they are writing up the dissertation. We also now require that fellows allocate in their budget that there, is, uh, there are funds for travel and lodging to the annual meeting. And again, the 2022 annual meeting is in San, Di in San Diego. Now, which becomes very important because fellows during the annual meeting will present their work in an invited poster session that we have. This is a poster session that is for sort of one part of it's the, as I'll say, the hallmark of the AERA professional development program where you, are, it's it, you will have an opportunity to present your dissertation research and to the education research community in this, in, in this special session. We make a point that we, have, we invite um, both junior and senior scholars to this, um, 
to the session and that they're also going to be deans of colleges and schools of education, as well as other funders and things, as we're presenting the best and the brightest, uh, not only from people who we funded through this program, the Minority Dissertation Fellowship Program, but our, our other fellowship programs, dissertation state level programs that AERA offers uh, during this, uh, this poster session. Also, as part of the annual meeting, there is, uh, we organize a, a special mentoring and career development workshop that is uh, with senior scholars. Uh, many of these scholars have, uh, are definitely, they're the leading people in their field. They've often been involved in our minority fellowship selection process, either the, the current process or in years past, and we're able to come together uh, at that point to have uh, this mentoring and career development workshop looking not only at what the scholars research is at the, at the current moment, but how is it you're developing the research agenda and thinking ahead to uh, next stages. So from it being other research to other, to uh, then other career opportunities from postdocs to faculty positions to other research related positions uh, at that stage. So this, that's pretty much the very specific things that the award entails. And that is for, and this is just over one year, usually in that, again, in that stage, most people will finish that year because that is, it is a one year fellowship. Now, the questions we always get, preparing the proposal, which is always an important uh, stage here, is what is, you're asking, what does I need to do? So, if, when you go into our website and you look at our, the web page, our announcement of the call for proposals, it, we have a, it's very clear and very straightforward what we are asking for in, in, the, in the actual dissertation research prospectus. Now, from, and it's, it's laid out from, that, from your abstract to the statement of your problem, talking about any theoretical or conceptual framework works that you're using in your work, some of the reviewing some of the literature uh, it's important that, it's, that your research questions are clearly defined um, as well in, in your in your research method because at this stage we do recognize that you should be you're, you're developing your dissertations many are actually collecting data of some sort at this point and really what, what is that the point where you are and how you can give a full explanation of what your research method is uh, as, and how this is uh, coming together. Uh, preliminary findings or anticipated findings are also key in this perspective, as well as really how you're, you're planning to disseminate information. This is the part of the, sort of this, the perspective is the, the heart of uh, the proposal and, the, and this, this application. I always suggest that any student and, and that work, they work, work closely with your, your dissertation chair, others on your dissertation committee as you develop this prospectus, uh, specifically for this program. A lot of times, uh, I think that there's one thing that's really important is that you know, I, I know that you as graduate students have, have written a lot of papers and I know a lot of schools have different um, plans that are or formats for the dissertation and just dis dissertation proposal, but it's very important that your proposal for our uh, dissertation uh, fellowship follows this format here. That that's so important. That it, and that that is clear. And then this is often another point too. As you work with your committee to develop your dissertation and develop this this proposal. Other things, though, to the outside of the the crux of the of the dissertation perspectives, and that's usually I would say the first part of that is about usually about eight pages. But we, we also give uh, unlimited space and appendices and things for supporting documents. So this could be that if you are, say, for example, there are, there's a survey instrument or interview protocols or specific variables and things from a, a, a large scale data set that you have opportunity to um, pull this, uh, this information together in an appendix that you, and that is, is discussed in the perspectives that you have a, a point there too to really, if you want to get more detail about an analysis plan, even if, if that be something that is 
you already have preliminary findings from interviews and focus groups and, and, you're, and you're already going to you can start discussing some of the themes and, the, and things of that nature in your uh, appendix. That's very helpful. I, any other analysis plans, it'd be the equations, those things too, for statistical research, that's very helpful. Tables and charts, pictures from field work, um, that, that is always all, also can be very helpful uh, in your supporting documents. Because this is, this is your point to also sort of show that this research is underway. If someone's out doing, doing field work, for example, in a community or in a school, and, and they're at that point preliminary work, they, they have findings they can share, that and if, it be, if it's pictures or things, things of that nature, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. One thing I will add though too, though just as sort of a cautionary note, it's, it's very important that uh, things are, are in sort of hard copy because our reviewers are not obligated to follow any links to any websites or things of that nature um, or video at that at this point. So if there's anything, all things that, that can be described in the dissertation that is very important. So you put you put you're putting these these pieces together. Your application then is something you will submit online through the AERA portal. These are due on Monday, November 16th, 2020. That's in a couple of months from now, and, it's, and that is by 11.59 p.m. Uh, Pacific time. Uh, so we are following the, the West Coast time for submitting that any, for this, this application. Uh, so it kind of gives the any people on the East Coast a couple of extra hours that day. So, but that's just something to know that how uh, that this process uh, will work. It's made online. And I'm gonna show you a few pieces of that. You know, the information for this is, you, you will, is on the AERA website, where you, will, you are able to access the call for proposals. And you see that is due, again, the deadline, November 16th, 2020. From there, you're able, there's the whole, the whole call describing what the program is, and again, pointing you to a place where you can actually submit that, your actual proposal. One of the other pieces is, as you start this, is that you, you're able to give your, your own username and password. Always ask, make sure that people, that you're able to, uh, make sure you save that information because AERA is unable to um, retrieve your, your password. So as you start an application and, and all, please, please do retain your, your own password. The information though that we'll ask, fairly straightforward in the application. There's some demographic information that we would like uh, that we ask of all of our applicants. Uh, and then we also, one thing I will make a note of, we ask that you know who your references are and what institution they're from. Uh, this is something that just, that's important because we, we need to be, you should ask, this uh, competition requires two letters of recommendation, the people who are very familiar with your work. In most cases, that is a dissertation chair, committee chair person, as well as someone else who is on um, the dissert dissertation committee who can attest to you to your study. Um, we also need, uh, require that you put together your, uh, a brief budget, uh, as well as you know, a, a two-page CV uh, that will be part of it along with your prospectus, and that these documents are then loaded as a PDF. Okay. Once you submit, You'll, you'll get a, an email message that will come to you from us saying that you've submit successfully uploaded your proposal. And uh, you know, if any, again, any questions, it's all, they're directed to us back at AERA. Decisions are usually announced uh, by May, May of 2021. So, and usually, you know, if there's any, any kind of indication, there's any question, something that is not, that seems like it's not right, you can always reach out to us directly, you know, in that time. 
Okay. So, so just just a couple other just sort of tips as again as I as I think as you we think about these um, proposals, I always say work very closely with your advisor and your mentors at, at your institution as you're working with them as you're developing not only your dissertation proposal but again as you're applying for this. Uh, competition. I know that that many institutions out there run workshops, and they even use our uh, competitions as models as to um, how to put together your proposals. And, and, and if others have have read and reread your your proposal, and you've had many different perspectives perspectives on your your, your dissertation perspectives, that that is very important, um, and that that it's clear, that it's concise, and and what's often really good about this too, as you're working with your advisors and others uh, on the proposal, that these are also the same people who will probably write for you. So and that they're very clear on what you're applying to and, and, and how your, your research fits with the, and the goals of the program and things of that nature and can attend and, and attest to how you have developed as a, a graduate student over, over the years. Very important too, that you have addressed all the questions that are in our, um, are in our prospectus that we, we're asking. Now, for example, there's one question that's very important. We often ask, especially for, for qualitative research, where we ask about researchers to discuss their positionality. What, you know, so that gives us a little bit of idea. You know, if you are working with an, an after-school program and that we learn that you were, at one point, you had volunteered yourself in this after-school program for many years, now you're you've come back as, as a researcher of research this program. That's clear. Or that is a school or school where you had been a, a teacher, for example. Um, you know, so that sometimes often helps to add some perspective to this, uh, where, how your position fits, uh, your positionality, that is, fits into the, the, the topic. And again, our application deadline is on November 16th. Okay, I'm going to stop a moment. I know that I'm seeing a lot of questions come into the question and answer box here and, and the chat and all too. And I know that Stephanie may have some, can, you know, may have a couple of questions that she may be summarizing some things I might want to say to address here. So Stephanie, is there anything Yes, so a lot of people are wondering about the timeline of the fellowship. Um, so they know that the application is due on November 16th, but when can they expect to hear back? Um, when would funds be um, distributed and so forth? Okay, well, that's, that, that, those are very good questions. Thank you. So yes, as I said, the deadline is uh, November, November 16th. We tend to, you know, like most of these competitions, uh, there'll be a couple of hundred at least proposals that will, um, will, will come in. And so we are then busily at work uh, in our review process and coordinating with our committee. Uh, if you are, for first of all, in this sort of time period, not only are the proposals due that day, but also the letters of recommendation are due that day as well. If you are missing something, we will let you know and, and sometime in November or December to, you know, to, to make sure that your application is complete and it, and it goes out for a, quite the uh, uh, thorough review. Do you do know that? Uh, announcements so are made, final decisions are made in May. So in, in May, that by, in, by May of 2021, we will send out our not only our acceptances, but those who were not able to fund, we will also notify them by email. Now, those who we do fund, the earliest date that we can start is July 1st. So that's July 1st of 2021. Many people often opt, though, to start at the beginning of their term, which could be, in that case, sometimes we're waiting until August, and in some schools that are on the quarter system, that could be September. We may have a little bit of flexibility, but we really, but sort of in that sort of July to early October or so time frame, we would like to, to begin funding. 
what this funding will be is it is up to 12 months at the $25,000. Typically, we will make three payments to your university uh, directly to the university and that aligns again with your budget and that we will work with your office of sponsored programs. Uh, as I said though too, you can use these funds for a lot. Many of our, our um, fellows will use these funds for living expenses, um, and occasionally other things of things of like buying a laptop and other things of that nature, other materials they may need. Tuition it can be used for as well, but, but again, we do encourage any cost sharing from universities so that if you then, um, you know, universities may then waive tuition and fees, uh, other fees, things like these can be not only some other research fees, but from, they could also be um, things like health insurance fees or things of that nature. Uh, the goal is, uh, you know, another question that often comes up, the same thing around the, you know, what do you budget it for in that year is, uh, can I hold a job, those type of things. Um, we, we do allow some other funding. If you do have things like small travel grants, you know, from the world is back open and people are traveling to conference, conferences and things of that nature, or if you're a research or teaching assistant and you are working um, somewhat that we, we do, allow, do allow that. I always, though, will say to anyone who's awarded this fellowship or any graduate student is that you know, really that, that last stage, the, that, that last year that you're working on the dissertation, that this can give you the, the, these funding opportunities and give you that, that time and that, that space where you're not necessarily working on anything that's not your, directly your research and that you're able to focus on your research, focus on your dissertation. Okay. What about, about other questions, Stephanie? So there have been quite a few questions about, you know, what defines education research. Can you talk a little bit more about what topics are acceptable for applicants? Okay, that is that's a very good question as well. Thank you. Education research, and I always say education research broadly defined. So there are studies then that focus in on around schools schooling issues, again, in various level of schooling from uh, preschool to K-12 that deal, deal within that school context, higher education, things that are about students at college campuses that are education research, um, also things around curriculum. I think for in many cases with someone who is in ed school, it's very clear that you know, things that they're studying, edu our education, if it's, if it's curriculum, if it's testing, um, the list goes on. Sometimes something, for example, if you're used, looking at something about, say, educational expectations and things of students from a psychological perspective, um, that is fine, but it, but it is also, it could be, you know, from that perspective of, say, psychology, but it is education research. What I'm all, often sometimes saying is that, you know, where there is a question, is sometimes it will have someone who is applying, maybe they are in um, biology, for example, a biology department. We probably often are not funding something that is say, um, you know, if it's, if it's you know, around um, biological research, for example, unless it is somehow couched in something like curriculum studies or science education, and that's in your theoretical frame. Um, one other thing that has to be very you know, careful, I think, is, is if you have any questions, for example, is this what I'm doing? Is it education research? You know, I am always open to, to if you can, you want us to reach out to me via email, to ERA, we'll, and you have an abstract of your study, we will, we can re review that and, and, and to give our actual opinion, is this education research? Basically knowing the who in the literature you're citing, is a literature from education perspective. A lot of times there's times studies that are around things like health, for example, and um, children's health and things that um, where it may be, is this a health study or is it an education study? So maybe the children are in schools, for example. So that's, that's really, you know, is, it, is this about the schools or is, or is it about a, a health policy? We always want to be able to bring this back to if it's something that either not only 
schools, again, from of all levels, K through up to post-secondary education have a, have a stake in or a sense, or is it is something that's individual about, about students, about their, about their learning and, and, or, or assessments of you know, achievement of learning? But again, if you have questions specifically about your study and you're not in a school of education, for example, and you want to just, what might this be something that fits, just, just, just reach out to us because we have funded things in the past, definitely a lot of historical pieces and historical pieces around education and schools, you know, for, uh, for example, um, history of uh, policy studies that are around education. We encourage studies that use large scale data sets such as those from the National Center for Education Statistics, U.S. Census, uh, that can connect to schools and, and learning, learning outcomes. Pause uh, Stephanie, other questions? Um, so many people have asked how many applicants we typically get, how many fellows are selected, and um, sort of like the rubric for which um, they'll be judged. Can you speak on that? Yes, yes, thank you, thank you. That is a, a good question as well. So first of all, I will say, you know, these, this is a very competitive fellowship program, as, as most, most of these are that are in, in education research. They're definitely um, quite, quite competitive here. And we, we may receive something like oh, I don't know, we may receive a couple of hundred or so um, proposals each year. But what I would like to also add to that is that should not stop you or discourage you from applying. Because I always say that the winners in any of these competitions depends on the quality of the applicant pool. So we typically in this program, we will find somewhere um, some say six to 15 studies um, each year. And, you know, that, and then that, again, how, how things are, how people are selected. Um, that, that's typically the numbers, but it could be lower, it could be more, just, it just not only depends on some, we have uh, our funding that's available, but again, the quality of the, of the proposals. One other thing to keep in mind, people asking often looking for a rubric, it is very important that your proposal is a study that is quite feasible and that it's clear and, that, and, and clear, concise, and it's something that's going to contribute it looks, uh, to scientific research. Again, we really want to expect our, our, our fellows that in the future, if not, or if not already, that they will be publishing research in peer-reviewed journals or in practitioner journals and education and education research that is that is very that's our goal and that there are people who are are poised to, uh, to share knowledge and to teach and things of that nature as faculty or as researchers and scholars so that you know, that they are definitely this is just one part of the the, the chain of uh, or as someone is developing their career as a researcher other pieces, uh, things that are very important that you have been prepared, that it's clear that you have had, say, if you're, you're doing some certain statistical techniques that you have experience in this, and, and we do uh, things like the, the uh, transcript as part of the application, and you send that, that we, we do look at those, that you've had um, adequate training, that that's clear. Uh, but the other piece that's always important in any of uh, these proposals is, uh, these are the letters of recommendation. And that you're getting good, you get, you're getting letters from people who know not only you, but know your work, know what your study is about, know what your study's potential contribution to the field is, and can attest to that, and can attest that this is something that is a this is a feasible study. This is where this is, is and and how and what what the contribution is to. So that's why I'm always so encouraging people to work with their um, faculty as they develop these proposals. Now, the other piece of that I will, will add though, is that how we do award about um, 15 or so of these fellowships or so, and, and 
in some form either of has been uh, full fellowships or a travel award or something of that nature is that we only, you know, you only, if you get an AERA award, then you would then, you're not able to accept our award and something else like from one of the other organizations like Spencer or Ford or some of the uh, other, other major funding, for example. You kind of only, in our case, you, we can't, we, you can't have both at the same time. So that's something that to keep in mind. But, but we, don't, we don't read each other, so, but just inevitably every year, um, I'll, we'll seek to find someone at first and they'll say, oh, but I got one of the other awards and maybe it's a few thousand dollars more or so. And it's like, okay, well, definitely understand. You should, you go ahead and you can take that other, that other award. Um, but again, these, these are competitive awards. Um, and it's, it's good to definitely follow the details of the call. And that, and honestly, that, that, that is with pretty much any fellowship program these applications that you definitely are following the, um, the instructions and responding to the questions as, as they are asked. Um, really quick, I just wanted to note that if we don't get to your question, you can always reach out to us directly. There are so many questions here that I have fallen behind, um, but also very quickly, education doctorates are um, eligible to apply for this fellowship as well as PhD candidates. Um, George, can you speak more on where um, applicants should be in their um, programs? We've had a lot of questions on if the data already needs to be collected, if they can apply, if they're you know not quite up to candidacy but will be during the start of the, the fellowship and so forth. Okay, and that's, that's definitely a good question too. Thank you, Stephanie, because that's, that sort of sometimes dictates when and, and when you apply. Um, where, but I'm going to stop and say, so the earliest we will start, you think about it, is this is a one-year fellowship, and this is your, your write-up year. Many people are at, a, say, year four or year five of their, of their studies. So where their study has, either the data collection is underway, it's already, you know, you've had IRB approval, and you're, you're in, out in the field doing some of that right at that point you are soon to advance, you're advanced or will advance to candidacy, this can be a good time for you to apply. Now, but, but the thing is, is, so for example, if your plan is, at this point, you should think about, these are people, if you're gonna finish, you're, you plan to defend in the 2021-2022 academic year. That is, it should be the, your, your thought, if that's who is most eligible for this. And so that could be it, you know, that you are, you are that far along with things, that you can present you know, a clear research method that you, you have that defined, has been vetted and approved by your committee, um, and that you are, you are ready to go and you know, to, to apply. Um, sometimes this is a good point where it is important to say, so to go back to your advisor, and as you read through our proposal and say, well, am I ready, is this going to be you know, in this next, this current academic year is a study far along enough that I know by summer of 2021, fall 2021, I will be able, I will be concentrating on writing the dissertation. And that'll probably be my only uh, objective is to, to is, is the write-up. Uh, and that, that your study's that far along. Because sometimes that is the thing that sometimes separates some studies is that just how developed the study is at the time of this proposal though? No. So this is like, this is November. So if you're at this point, if you know right now you have, you're out, you know, you have a pilot study that you've been involved in, you have questions, research questions that you are you're, you're going to be addressing, you're out in the field collecting data, there's some preliminary findings, then, you know, this might be a good time to, to present that and this is your study and that you want this extra, you need this extra support as you finish your, your dissertation. But if you're still sort of in that sort of stage of uh, um, you're really kind of figuring out the ideas, what you're going to study, well, maybe maybe it's a moment that now you might want to pause. Maybe it's not this year, but maybe it's next year that you uh, you apply for for this. But this is um, again something you should have a, that conversation uh, with your advisor to see are are you are you ready? Okay. All right. And I know Stephanie's getting a lot of questions there. 
others. Um, George, quite a few people, let me see here, are asking what will help them be most competitive in the past. What did proposals look like? Can we, you know, provide sample proposals? You know, they're really concerned with, with doing their best when submitting their application. So can you speak to that? Great, definitely. That's, that's always, everyone asks that question every year. At first I will say, we do not have past proposals that are available to, that we can share. Um, you know, although we do publish who we've, who we've funded in, over the years. Um, to really making yourself most competitive is that, that your study, that it's, that it's clear, that it's concise, that it's something that's contributing to research, that, it's, that you have um, not only yourself read through this and, and, and really um, made sure it's a thorough proposal, but, that, but again, you've worked with your committee, they've worked not only on your, your, your study and that you're far enough along, that you have the evidence that you can pull things together. Um, what a strong proposal might look like is when it's clear that not only say, for example, maybe you're collecting data right now and you have things like an observation guide in, in addition that you can, you can provide, or you have uh, interview protocol that you've already developed that have been vetted and IRB approved and that your committee even attests to that this study is super and this is great and, this is, and we all know this is about to make a contribution to the field. Um, there are some tips and I, I, that what things I'm often very uh, will, will pass on is that this in some ways as you're putting together this prospectus you want to make this a new sort of document. It sometimes is very clear when someone is taking taking a part from their uh, either a, a class paper or from uh, a special field exam or something of that nature, and they're sort of plopping it into this. Uh, oh, here's a literature review. It doesn't now. Although we have these different sections, we want to make sure that it, it should it should make sense in a sense that it all hangs together, that it gels together together. If there are transitions and you're clear why you're you're talking about. Um, Say, for example, a theory, uh, for example, if you choose something like critical race theory, uh, if that's how you're framing your work, how this fits, and that you have a clear understanding of the theory, now it's fitting to your own, your own work. Those are, the, are the, the, the best, I think, proposals that, um, you know, where it's clear what the research questions are and how you, you go from, it's clear how you go from your literature to the, and the framework and all to these research questions that the methods you're using can address these research questions, that you have a, uh, this, now it's, it's these preliminary findings or anticipated findings from your research, that that is very clear and that all fits. And then also that you've thought down, down the road to the next step as to where then would this research be published? What journals, um, which conferences you think you, you would probably present at beyond AERA even, um, you know, where it fits, so that, that that is all clear. Those are, so, those are some of the things that um, I think often will make a proposal or a study stand out. Um, a unique contribution. Now, if you look at some of the work that we're, we're funding or have funded uh, recently, there's a, for us, one of the studies right now is, is looking at child care workers uh, in workers in early child care using data, uh, pre-administrative data. So these are the, uh, you know, sort of working with young children, these are the workers, and looking at their work experience, for example. Something that's pretty uh, unique and novel. So this contribution. Um, you know, uh, you know, other studies that are historical analysis, things that have not been addressed, say for example, there's a study now that, I, that is around looking at uh, a science society that was in historically black college back, uh, it's been around since the 40s in the Science Society and how they responding, uh, the society had responded to um, specific issues in education, for example. Things that they're seeing unique and novel and that again, will, you think will make a contribution to the field. Other? George, can, Maybe for our last question, I see that we have four more minutes left. Yeah. Many people have asked about 
how we select um, kind of who reviews our, our reviewers, um, who's looking at uh, the applications, um, how are they selected, and what are their credentials. That, now, so there is the AERA Minority Dissertation Fellowship Committee uh, that is appointed by the AERA presidents. So when I say that, and that we have a, a new president each year, and each year the president will have two members say that they have appointed to this committee. Committee members are on for our, our re review for about three years or so. They are a standing member of this committee. And they sent, tend to have backgrounds that are across the education research field from people who are doing education policy to uh, others doing curriculum and design, STEM research. So it's in higher ed, for example. One of the things though that's, that's, been, that's important, so that's our core committee. Um, uh, but as we, re I review, I will say I will review your application as, it, as it, we will co it comes in. If I see that there's an education research topic that maybe our core members uh, do not have a specialization in, we invite other scholars who may have that, that area. So if there is someone who is, for example, uh, where your, your, your specialty is, um, let's say, it's something like early childhood, for example, uh, doing early childhood research, and we didn't have an early childhood person on our committee. I, well, I may have to reach out to others, to other, other senior scholars in the field to review, your, to review that proposal as well. All proposals are reviewed by you know, if, you know, at least three, or, or three of our committee members as a, uh, just one way of thinking about it, and, that, and, and, re and reviewed and vetted um, through multiple rounds of the, uh, review. So this is sort of what happens between November 16th and May in that time before we make the announcements that proposals have gone through multiple rounds of review, and questions, and you know, so you know, these are definitely strong people in the field who uh, will know, know this research. Um, you know, so that yeah, it, it becomes for us, it's, it's a, a lot of work, but it's also, uh, I think, a lot of important work that we do. And that we're able to not only we're seeing what the next generation of faculty and scholars are, looks like uh, and the quality of their work. So, hope that answers that question. And I don't want to go over too much here. So, in our last couple of minutes, um, I know one of the things I'll just reiterate if you have any questions, there is you can email us at fellowships at AERA. Net. That's the easiest way to get back to get in touch with us. We are going to get a log of today's questions in the chat, and we are able to put together a, a frequently asked questions from that, and we will send that out to uh, all of the uh, sort of I think nearly 1,800 people who signed up for today's um, virtual webinar. Also, you might notice that we have been recording, so. This webinar eventually will be on the uh, AERA Virtual Research Learning Center that you'll be able to access this and then within the next couple of weeks or so that you'll have this so it'll be there once again if you need to re-watch it or, or if you're at a university you want to uh, you're gonna share this with other your, your peers and other colleagues. So that information is there. Uh, we definitely we welcome, again, your proposals. We welcome your questions. Do not hesitate. Um, you know, with any of those things, not, because if, if you, you think there's something that you're ready for to apply you, to, you should go ahead and do it with, with guidance, again, from your committee. I highly encourage you to do that. Uh, Stephanie, is there anything else I've missed? I know we're about that time. I don't think so, George. I think creating this question and answer sheet that you spoke of will be really helpful. There were lots of questions that, um, were unanswered, but can be found in the call on the website um, as well in this as well as this webinar. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie, and and I want to thank you all for joining us. Review the the, the AERA website. If you have questions? Email us again too, uh, and we look forward to receiving your proposals in, on November sixteenth. Thank you. <laughs>